So I thought we would jump right into now um, some of my pieces, and I wanted you to have the music in front of you. So a lot of the pieces in this particular suite would probably not be difficult for you to understand right off the bat. They have melody, they have harmony, they use pianistic techniques like different kinds of pedaling, register. Um, but there are a couple of movements that are more abstract. And I thought that we'll discuss each movement and then on the ones that are more abstract, I'll try to give you some insight as to how you might approach that kind of music when you come across it from another composer. There are certain things that happened in the 20th century that really changed music beyond probably what you imagine. Okay, we all know 20th century music has hundreds of styles, but there are certain aspects that cross those styles. Uh, we'll get to that. All right, so Jacob, I'm gonna uh, talk about each one and then take questions and then we'll do the, the next one. So this, this set of pieces uh, was commissioned by a Steinway artist and he wanted specifically these preludes and he came up with like three names like velvety. He wanted them to show off Steinway pianos colors. So I added two more and so each one basically exploits what the Steinway can do, one specific thing. So it's not 12, it's only five. And they can be performed not as a, a suite, you can pick and choose. Um, but we're gonna start with sparkling. Come on, Jacob. So in this piece, it's the first piece, you can see that it's these high arpeggios and the piano has no damper on the, um, on the upper strings. So they always ring, but they don't ring for a long time. And the reason for that is that the notes are pretty high. They actually have just as many overtones as the low notes do, but those overtones go out of our hearing rather quickly. So we don't hear the whole complex sound. So overtones are hugely important in 20th century and 21st century music. Do you all know what the overtone series is? The harmonic series, partials. Okay, so let me show you. Every sound that vibrates in a steady way will sound like a pitch of some kind. Every pitch that you hear is the result of something vibrating in the air fast enough that it produces a pitch. And then everything that has a pitch, everything that has a pitch has overtones. So I'm gonna play this resonance for you so that you can hear. I'm just gonna do this very quickly because I might use the board. But if I, well, I'll put it up really fast. So pitched sounds vibrate in a particular set of proportions. And so if we, we're going to start with this low C, and then a violin, an oboe, not so much the flute, piano, uh, timpani even. To some degree, they have overtones that go in this very specific pattern. It's kind of funny, B, etc. How many of you have ever blown on a a brass instrument and you blow harder and it pops up an octave and you blow harder and it pops up a twelfth. Well, that's what brass instruments do. <laughs> just, just so you know. You can get one and you can blow hard. But this is what's sounding, but our ears resolve it down to the bottom note. So now I'm going to play this and you're going to hear. And if you can't hear, then I really want you to come over here and put your ears in the piano. So let me get all this. How does this Austin Middle pedal work on this? Is it good? Okay, so I'm gonna play that low C. Can you hear all that ringing off? Yeah. 
If you can't, come over here. Seriously, come on. Come on, come on. Put your head in the piano. Come on. Seriously, this is a really important lesson for 20th century music. Hugely important. So if you can't hear it, come on over here. They can all hear it. You hear the haze? You need the crown. You hear the mist? Come on and put your ears in. Exactly. Yourself so says so come. I heard it. Can fit in here. Well, if you had a chance, back up and let another ear come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, one more time. One more time. You hear the mist? That's the overtones. So it's those overtones. Yeah, in that pattern. Yeah. And then you play here with the uh, sustain. Yeah. Right, I have that too in, in one of the movements. So here I'll just play a different overtone series. Here? Mm -hmm. Or here? Cool, right? So in the 20th century, we learned this. It was known in the 18th century to physicists, but in the 20th century, we learned this by being able to see it on a spectrograph. So there was a way to look at it through the computer where you could see all those overtones. You could see all of them happening. Okay, so back to this. So some of this music cares more about the overtones than the pitch. It's creating a complexity. Also, noise, sounds that's noise, has overtones too. But they don't fall in the pattern. They're overtones that don't fit in the octave, fifth, fourth, major third, minor third overtone series, okay? So overtone series is really, really important that you understand. It's a physical phenomenon. It's in every piece of music. Uh, it's in every time you hear a pitch, you're hearing overtones. And the overtones of a violin, sometimes the third one is stronger, sometimes the fifth one is stronger, sometimes the second and fourth are stronger. Each instrument has its own set of which overtones are stronger and which are weaker. And that is the difference between a violin sound and an oboe sound. It's which overtones are ringing louder. So it's like a secret, like a mist, but it's always there. So now when you think about a melody or you think about a chord cluster like you were thinking of, you have to listen in. You can't just listen to the single note. You have to listen to the whole thing. So a lot of 20th century music that's what it's about, is creating your mist or emphasizing it. Okay, so in this particular piece, we have the upper notes that ring, but they don't ring super long because the overtones of a note that's like this high go right off where we can hear. So you're gonna hear a little bit of sparkle, and since he's not holding down any of the lower notes, nothing below it is ringing. So we're just hearing the crispness of these high notes. And then, for some contrast, I let him put on the pedal and sweep down, and you'll hear the, those overtones ring. The sound will be very different than the very crisp top arpeggio. Suddenly it'll go like that. And it's because of what notes am I allowing to come in, and how long am I allowing them to ring, okay? So, sparkling. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
should be voiced and what shouldn't be voiced. It'll affect on your pedaling, obviously, right? Could you hear the very distinct differences between the upper notes that were dry and then when I put in the sweep? In fact, it wasn't just, you know, an arpeggio downward. It created a mass of sound that just kind of hangs there, okay? So that's a musical gesture that's not a melody, that's not a harmony, but that is found a lot in 20th century music. Okay, so we'll talk about, any questions about this one? Okay, let's talk about the next one. This piece is called Pearly. Pearly makes use of the sostenuto pedal. So there's a lot of silently depressing the keys low or playing the keys low and then catching them in the sostenuto pedal so that they keep ringing while the hands can play other things on the top. It's so like an etude almost for sostenuto pedal. So this bass here is push, push the down silence. In silence. And yeah, it's caught, but it will it will be cleared and caught again and caught again and caught again. But so you see the sostenuto? It'll be played and then he will catch this note, mm. but then he has to clear it and like catch each of the super low bass notes. Like play, release. Yeah, so it's basically like he has to deal with two sets of pedals. So and he has to... Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have other music where you, you prepare it with a chord and then you catch it and you don't have to clear it. But this is definitely a pedaling etude. But I call this pearly because it always reminds me of Claire de Lune. Because it's, this will be a very French sound. And when I say that, the French today are the composers who care the most about overtones and colors and how you shade a particular sound. Some of you were very interested in Messiaen, Ventre Garde, Ce L'Enfant Jésus, right? That's, he was the teacher of all the French composers who are writing with overtones. He has a book where he talks about chords of superior resonance and inferior resonance. You can look him up. But Knowing what I've just told you, you'll hear that music completely differently. Go. Curly.
piece. Where you, in that piece, I use those low notes like the way an organist would use a pedal. But it's much harder you know, to clear the chords on top of the pedal tone without them ringing constantly and making a big, huge mess. So that's why he has to catch the bottom one with the sostenuto, and then he can use the regular pedal to clear the chords. Um, but having that pedal tone means I can put this progression on top of it, and some of the chords are dissonant, and some are consonant, and you can resolve a phrase just by moving the chord on top of the bottom note. So it creates a very beautiful kind of a dissonance, and then a consonance, and then a dissonance. Same way that a pedal tone will in Bach, for example. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you were able to sort of focus on how those chords fit and didn't fit with the lower note, but the lowest notes were shooting off overtones. And whenever he played a chord that was inside of that low notes overtone series, and in fact, the notes get like really, really close together after the 12th partial, like super, super like quarter tone close. So that low note in, in the chords he's playing, almost every note in the chords is part of that overtone series of the low note. So it sounds really clear and really nice. And that's something for you to think about. If you are playing a piece by Brahms, Brahms likes to have small intervals low. And what that does is it creates two competing overtone series. So if I can, pl I can play this, it sounds very nice, right? But if I play this, it sounds like a big mess, right? That's because I have this overtone series, this one, this one, this one, and when they get higher, they start to compete against each other. So that might help you when you're thinking about how do I voice this, you know? Think about, well, what do I need to de-emphasize so that it doesn't create a big bunch of clashing overtones up on top of it? All right, any questions about that one? Okay, so here I am talking about something. How many of you have ever talked about music this way before? About blending these upper partials? So good, something new. And a way for you to engage with some music more deeply than the people you're going to be competing with. All right, velvety. Velvety, I think this was one of uh, Bill's titles. And this one, it's like a Mendelssohn song without words. This one is low. And so he has to be really, really careful to bring out the melody because the overtones are going to be going like crazy. But this is a piece that you would not need me to introduce. You too. You would be able to look at this score and play this piece without me. So I'm going to let him go ahead and play it again. The etude will be for the middle register voicings, and you'll hear it quite clearly. And then you can ask me any questions you want to.
that piece is constructed with romantic elements, right? Melody, the harmony is, is iterated in the running notes, right? Not a difficult piece for you to interpret on your own. But do, if you have any questions about it, I would be happy to answer them. It's a really different color, though, than the other pieces in this particular piece. Um, all right, the next piece is the most abstract of the pieces. It's the most difficult. Um, it doesn't have a melody. It doesn't really even have harmony. The whole piece is contained in the dynamic swells and releases between each hand. And it's all tremolo, trill and tremolo, independent. The other thing is I call this brittle because I want you to hear the hammers, the hammer sounds. So that's a part of the piece, that's a timbre of the piano that composers rarely would use. But I wanted that particular sound. So another way of introducing a noise element or a coloristic element into the piece that you would not find in Mendelssohn. All right, brittle.
it's nine. Just a few more. Okay, I want to play the, the last piece for you. But I do want to ask you some questions about that piece. Okay, but I, they're tired. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you if you were able to hear that piece differently than if I hadn't told you anything about overtones or mist or colors. Yeah, yeah. So it would be very easy if you didn't know that my intention was for you to hear that woodiness of the hammers, for you to try to mask it somehow, right? Because often you're taught, you know, that's, a, that's noise, this is music. But in the 20th century, those things come together. Those things come together. Um, it's hard when you hear a piece that has no melody, right? Really no harmony. It was just intervals expanding and contracting, right? Sometimes dissonant, sometimes consonant. But you can't shape a piece by bringing out a voice, right? So this piece hopefully will serve as kind of a bridge for you to look at some more textural kinds of pieces. Uh, but the last piece, this is also one of those pieces that you really, you don't need to know anything about the 20th century to understand this piece. It's quite short. It's called Thunderous. I think that was mine, my name. Brittle and Thunderous, I think, were mine. Um, and I'll just let Jacob play it. One thing, though, this is the piece where oh, you get to play. Don't you love that? Urgh, right into that piano. Just dig in. So this is my dig in piece. <laughs> It must be a tough to play for a bunch of really fine pianists and the composer, right? <laughs> no, but thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Um, so again, any questions about that piece? That piece, pretty much, if you play anything, you know, late Romantic, early 20th century, that it has melody, it has harmony, it has rhythm, it has all of those things, register and voicing that you would normally bring out in, in a in a romantic piece. Okay, so any questions? Because I don't. Sure. I think it was very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I think he would want to say thank you too. Yeah, so each one I tried to give you a feeling. Like, and that one was thunderous, you know, big, stormy, just. Like really angry. Yeah. Power. I think it's power, yeah. And, and there's something, even listening to it, you can almost feel, right? That feeling of, you know, just pounding away. And yeah, he has to bring it back a little bit so he can bring it out again a little bit more. But uh, I think that's fun. Also, alternating the hands, that's always fun, right? Just dig into the big chords. Um, anything else? Question? Can you give us some Mm -hmm. Quick. <laughs> well, he, he might be able to. Um, these particular pieces lie pretty well under the hands. 
So I know a certain amount of what you do becomes just muscle memory pretty quickly in, and that's true of like sparkling. Like, go ahead and, and show. The, these two chords just inter, interlace. So it wouldn't, and, and a lot of this is quite rep, rep, repetitious, repetitive. Those are the two words I was trying to get out. Um, and so my suggestion, the way I think about it is, it's music, it's a gesture. Learn the gesture, and then you have to analyze. So do you analyze music at all that you play? Like, do you look for, okay, where's the A theme, where's the B theme? What happens with these things over this piece? Does it change keys? Does it change register? Where are variations, etc.? I mean, you guys probably do all of that stuff, right? With this music that you understand, tonal music, we'll say. You can do the same thing with 20th century music. So I just told you, if we look at brittle, the really hard one, to, you know, this is all atmosphere, this piece. It's all a mood. It puts you in a place, and you hear a particular feeling. But if you analyze it, you can see, well, it just starts from a, a slow trill into a tremolo, and then we have a minor second ascending, and a minor second descending. And then the next change makes it a major second ascending and a major second descending. And that's not hard to memorize. Because now I know the pattern and it's predictable. It's just gonna keep getting larger and larger intervals in each hand. Then we have this little spot in the middle where you might say to the composer, what were you thinking there? That didn't make sense to me. Um, but then when you look at it going back, it goes from the larger intervals, and each one gets smaller by a half step over and over. Probably you could now go play that piece without even seeing the music because it's put together very predictably. So once you start getting into 20th century pieces, you approach them on their own terms. You can't approach this piece looking for the melody, right? You will be disappointed. But if you approach it on its own terms, and you look at what's happening, you see, oh, well, this is a lot of you know, tremolos getting bigger and then getting smaller. And then you know, memory is not a problem. I think interpretation might be a problem, right? So you have my email. <laughs> you know, it's a, if you don't speak Greek, and I drop you in the middle of Greece, you're gonna have a little trouble <laughs> like trying to figure out what's going on, right? But if you study Greek for a month before I take you, you'll know a little bit more about what's going on, right? If you devote a year to studying Greek, you're gonna be fine. Everything's gonna make sense and you're gonna understand what's being said to you. It's the same thing with new music. If you don't know anything about it going in, like me when I was a kid, didn't get it. But I kept at it, and I studied, and I read about it, and I listened to pieces like in this suite, there are some pieces that are 20th century, but not so far away from what I understood that I can't understand them. Then there are other pieces that are kind of far away, right? But the more I learned, the better I got. Just like if you're playing Beethoven, the more you analyze, the more you learn about Beethoven, the more you immerse yourself in that music, the more you understand it. And it's the same thing with 20th century music. Hopefully I've given you, I've opened a door for you, a different way to start maybe thinking about music. But 20th century music, if you don't have a melody and you don't have harmony, then you need to let the piece speak to you, right? Because you're not gonna hear the familiar stuff that you're used to hearing. Okay, this piece will be in Greek. But if you spend a little time, get to know a little bit about Greek, you might be able to translate it in a meaningful way. So most of you are gonna go to college, you're gonna have a class on 20th century music, 21st century music. The thing to remember is that it's not a thing. 20th century music is not a thing. Pretty much like, it's an extension of the romantic period where every composer was a personality. That's still true today. Every composer, Ligeti, Shostakovich, right? 
Steve Reich, Frederick Zhevsky, they are all personalities. And so you have to let their music speak to you. You have to learn a little bit about it. And then usually it's like a glass of water, crystal clear, crystal clear. This piece, Brittle, I hope it's crystal clear to you guys. You heard it once, but I'm able to tell you a little bit about it, and now you know. This is what the piece is. It's an experience. It's a little bit creepy, <laughs> maybe. It's about all this sort of floating sound out there, and it doesn't have to have a melody, right? So I encourage you, I encourage you, when you're faced with a piece that you just don't get, I always tell my students, listen three times. Listen three times. The first time, won't make any sense. The second time, you'll catch a few things, maybe phrasing something. The third time, you'll start to hear music. The third time. Start with Fabern. It's very short. You can listen to like a piece in 20 seconds. They weren't listened to five times, but by the third or fourth time, you'll hear the music. So I even if you're not taking a course in it, that's what you want to do. You want to just start looking at the major 20th century composers, li pick a piece, listen three times. And then you'll, eventually you'll speak Greek and French and Spanish and Russian, okay? And Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions? I, I meant to have a break in the middle, <laughs> but we didn't have a break, so if you guys are exhausted, I understand. Did, did this help you guys? You feel more like you want to maybe contact some of the people whose names are on the music? You really should. You really should because the composer wants to know you and that you're playing their music. And then, you know, work with your friends. Work with your friends. Someday your friends will be 45, you'll be 45. You both have careers. Be mutually beneficial. Unless your friend stinks as a composer, then you don't want to play their music. <laughs> Ask, can I see the score before I say yes? And then we need to discuss my fee, right? Okay, that's, that's what you learned tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. All right.